innovation, disruption, and big issues. This is Business Game Changers with Sarah Westall. 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 Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. Today, we are going to have the second part of our riveting conversation with Annie Jacobson. She is a Pulitzer Prize finalist from her last book, and her new book just came out, and it's called Phenomena. It is a deep research book on the secret investigations that the government has done into ESP and different phenomena that occurs within people's brains and ability to communicate with each other from things like ESPs, bending spoons, to remote viewing, to map dowsing, to all sorts of interesting topics. So let's get right back into that interview with Annie Jacobson. Our employees at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow were being essentially guinea pigs of the Soviet Union. We, the Americans, the CIA and the Defense Department, knew this was going on and neglected to tell the employees of the embassy that they were being they were being penetrated by these beams. And instead, we set up a program at the embassy where, whereby we took everyone's blood there, yes. saying, you know, there was some kind of a virus going around and we just needed blood samples. So that really moves into the nefarious realm where you have the, the Defense Department knowingly, uh, knowing that its employees were under, you know, were in harm's way and not doing anything. And wasn't there a massive lawsuit over this situation that ultimately didn't go anywhere? But uh, what happened there? Well, you know, all of these employees uh, banded together and took a class action suit against the government, but the government has a lot of lawyers and ways of putting the kibosh, if you will, on this, and that's exactly what happened. And no, none of the employees ever got one cent, and um, many of them died of cancer. And, uh, you know, whenever a situation like that arises, the government is, is very much in the position and do, do say, they say, you know, you cannot determine that the cause of cancer was necessarily the so-called Moscow single signal. Yeah, well, I suppose they have a point there, but at the same point, you allowed us to get fried and all you did is take our blood and test us. <laughs> I, You know, it would, that would create some anger there, I, I'm sure, which it did. That's what the lawsuit was about. Okay, so go ahead. Well, just when you think of the numbers, you know, um, the employees filed $250 million worth of lawsuits against the government for this exposure to the Moscow signal, which was linked somehow in ways that are still very mysterious to ESP and psychokinesis. In response to the lawsuit, the State Department funded a $1 million study to prove that there was no harm done. And guess who won. And so you can see where the government yes. chose to put its money. Yes. Well, okay. Well, it, well, there's a lot of skeptics too. They don't believe that this stuff really works, or, but they know. Well, I want to move on to um, the point where the CIA, it moved, this whole program moved from the CIA to the Department of Defense, which we've already talked about, but it was put under graph. And this graph character has is interesting, and he had an experience that changed his life as well. Like so many of the characters that you're talking about, you have a theme that you've created in this book, which is very interesting. Can you share what happened in his life and how that affected him? So Dale Graff was a fascinating civilian scientist uh, with the Air Force at the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. During the Vietnam War, he gets assigned to Hawaii, and then he gets sent off to Vietnam to train pilots in sort of anti-Soviet aircraft tactics. And he comes back, and he has an experience swimming in the ocean saving the life of a drowning woman. I don't want to give away the details because they are so remarkable. And when Graf told me this story, it was one of those, you know, reporter's moments where it just takes your breath away because it was so sincere, it was so real, and it's so inexplicable what happened to him. But in essence, he had his conversion moment. 
where he, like Mitchell coming home from the moon, suddenly saw the world in a way in which he had not seen the world before, Graf said. And so what he did was he didn't change much on the outside, but he began going to the library and looking into uh, reading everything he could on consciousness, on human perception, on sentience in the brain, on how the mind works. This experience that he had told him he wasn't crazy. I mean, here was a guy with a top-secret clearance for his very hard science work he was doing for the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force, and yet something had happened to him that was inexplicable. And so he said that, you know, suddenly this was more interesting to him than anything he was working on. So he continued working um, in his job, but he also began to write up proposals to the Defense Department informing them that they, too, should look into what he called the executive control system of the mind, which when you think about where we are today with artificial intelligence and you think about the fact that Dale Graff was presenting the Pentagon with this idea in the late 1970s, he really is a forward-thinking person. And the Defense Department went for it, and Graff sought out the CIA scientists who were working on this similar program, and there began, that's really the origin story of what then went on for the next 20 years at the Pentagon. And I loved interviewing Dale Graff because he'd never told his story to a journalist before. And it's really a remarkable story, in my opinion, of a man absolutely considered committed to science, but his personal experiences were such that it opened up a different doorway to a different pursuit of knowledge. Yeah, and that's the theme of all these people that you've been interviewing uh, and talking to throughout your book is there's something happens and they experience something and are like, wait a minute, this things are different than I thought. But Graf, when he took over the program, he changed and coined the term pair of paraphysics and That's right. he, he wanted it to be more considered more hard science because it wasn't the phenomena paranormal wasn't really respected now did he end up garnering more respect when he changed the term did it ultimately ha- help raise the level of respect it's such a great question and the answer is no i mean <laughs> you know there's there is such a stigma attached to all of this you can call it just about anything and it's still going to stink to a lot of scientists. Um, But he was hired, that paraphysics term was something he coined because he was hired by the Defense Department to write what is now this very sort of legendary report um, called Paraphysics Research and Development Warsaw Pact. And he looked at all of the research going on out of the Soviet Union and what they were doing. Um, he was the man who wrote the report on, that's very legendary within these circles about a famous Soviet psychic and telekinetic, um, psychokinetic person uh, named Nina Kulangina. She was kind of the Uri Geller of the Soviet Union. But there were films that were leaked out of the Soviet Union. And as Graf says, we still don't know today whether or not these were real films or whether they were meant to be plaque propaganda, whether they were staged. But what they show is Nina Kulangina, this sort of beautiful housewife, who, by the way, um, when she was 15 years old, was a tank operator in the Battle of uh, Leningrad. So... No, no shortage of rich narrative history for her. But they show her in the 60s in this laboratory allegedly being able to stop the beating heart of a frog using her mind. And this really freaked out the Pentagon. And Graf was in charge of writing up this report and trying to explain what was going on. And the conclusion by many of the Defense Department analysts was, we at least have to look into this. Because if this is a real capability, then essentially a Soviet spy could stand next to a congressman or a military general or, God forbid, the president and stop their beating heart. I mean, that's how far they took it in terms of trajectory. So what did it end up happening? With that, how did what it? Did gave it gave quite a bit of money. It gave funding to the program, and you know, it's always the the incremental movement toward a bigger program. That's what happened here. And this, you know, the Congress approved a small amount of research for it. Graf started the first program, but Graf had a remarkable success right away with one of the programs, 
and it had to do with finding a lost fighter jet, and it went all the way to the president, and there are documents to demonstrate this, which make it pretty remarkable. So the um, Graf had a small program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base with some psychics, and he was working on trying to learn what the CIA had done and model it, Um, and there was a crisis, and he gets called into his boss's office that a Soviet bomber jet has crashed in Africa. As it turned out, the pilot wanted to defect, so he bailed out of the aircraft, and it was on autopilot, so the the CIA determined that this aircraft, it's kind of this marvelous image, would continue to fly on its own until it ran out of gas, at which point it would crash. And that's exactly what happened. And this and the CIA went crazy, like, oh my God, and this was a classified jet. We had never seen this Soviet, the insides of the Soviet bomber before. And the CIA thought to itself, can you imagine what we could learn if we could get a hold of this aircraft and examine what's inside? So they put satellites on it. They put, you know. Uh, CIA paramilitary units into the jungle, they couldn't find the jet. They literally had no idea where it was. It was like a huge swath of jungle where it could be. Well, Graf put his psychic on it. And lo and behold, her name was Rosemary Smith. She was able to locate the downed Soviet bomber through map dousing. I mean, literally. You know, this is where it is. She drew that she worked with the, the geographers um, at. Uh, Wright Patterson and created this very specific detailed location, you know, behind this river, over this hill, through this woods, and the coordinates. They sent the CIA paramilitary team there. And the way it's described in the declassified documents is marvelous. The team is there in the woods, like hacking around with machetes, literally. And they see a native person come out of the jungle holding the cushion of an airline seat. And they said, bingo. And they asked that person, take us to the aircraft. And it was right down the road, you know, right down the jungle road, in essence. And this was such a remarkable win that Graf was sent to the Pentagon to brief top military generals. Again, the declassified documents, which I reveal for the first time in Phenomena, are just remarkable because half the generals are like, this is nonsense. And the other half are leaning forward saying, you know, tell us more. And ultimately... This report, because it was so successful, went all the way to President Carter, who later spoke about it publicly uh, after he was no longer president. What's so amazing is that these things are happening, and you you might say, okay, we can't rely on this as something that's going to be, uh, you know, reliable. But we can't deny it exists. I mean, when stuff like that happens, how can you deny that this stuff exists? And the scientific skeptics will tell you, well, that was a coincidence, you know. She happened, she just coincidentally, in terms of mathematical, you know, good luck, if you will, went to this area and they would put all the emphasis on the native coming out of the jungle with the seat. And that is another way of thinking about it. And I, again, in Phenomena, in reporting the book, I tried to tell the story neutrally, down the middle, showing the alternative explanations and letting the reader ultimately decide what they think. But I will say, here's a little comment on the American public in general. So back in the 50s, a Harvard experimental psychologist named Gertrude Schmeidler created a system in which to think about how individual Americans think of extrasensory perception, psychokinesis, map dousing, these ideas. And she said, on the one hand, you have goats. The goats are the scientific skeptics. They say there's no way. This is hogwash nonsense. And on the other side, you have the sheep. And the sheep are open to the idea of psychic functioning. Well, a recent Gallup poll shows that 74% of Americans are sheep. They are open to this idea, whereas a minority, 26% are goats, are scientific skeptics. It's just that the skeptics have a very loud and vocal voice. They're still saying things like, you know, 
this is all occult, this is all supernatural, and it's dangerous the way the Nazis were dangerous. Well, it seems like they're more sure of themselves. The sheep are like, yeah, but I don't know, really know what it is. You know, it's like, wow. There's probably, there's a few that are super sure, but most of the people that believe in it aren't going to, you know, stop around and wave their fists around. Whereas the skeptic, skeptics seem so much more hardened to what they believe. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the sheep are can kind of entertain the idea, and that gives you a lot more leeway because you're not dedicating your your job or your profession to it. You're just simply interested when someone tells you a story, you know, or a friend visits a psychic and seems to say something that you find, you know, divinatory, let's say. But again, reminder, the, this world in the civilian sector is peopled by charlatans and frauds and yes. snake oil salesmen. I mean, there is no doubt. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. And what I found fascinating reporting phenomena is that, lo and behold, the Defense Department agrees with that idea, that you, it's not, they're not all charlatans. When you can look at someone in the present day, they're looking at soldiers in the field who are able to foresee, let's say, an IED planted. Um, now they want, and then the, the Defense Department will, you know, the soldier would say in one instance, and I'm referring to a, uh, a situation at the Office of Naval Research where they have a program going on now, which they call the Spidey Sense. Um, the proper program name is Anomalous Mental Cognition. It was born out of the uh, war in Iraq where there was a group of soldiers about to go on patrol down a road. One of them said, I, I sense I know, I see an IED buried there. They sent a robot in, and there was an IED there. Now that soldier becomes very interesting to the Defense Department. And in the Office of Naval Research Program, that's where they're using computer technology. I mean, this is, you know, we have technology that is unavailable, unimaginable, even a decade ago. Mm -hmm. They're using that technology to look at man's physiology and to, to try and determine once and for all, is this fact or is this fiction? You know, is it science? Is it the supernatural? And I mean, it's an amazing quest journey for a reporter like me because you say, you know, you're right at the edge of your seat. My God, will they find out in the modern age that I live? Or will it continue to be this unsolvable mystery? Well, you talk about in the book that ultimately the Department of Defense program under Graf had a downfall. What ultimately caused that downfall? So within the realm of the sheep, okay, within the people who believe, you refer to the small group who is actually convinced, right? So those that would be where the scientists and the psychics live, who absolutely, you know, they're not open to the idea. They they are they are committed to the idea that that extrasensory perception, psychokinesis, these are real phenomena, albeit fickle. They split into two groups. One group says it's biological. Um, the other group, so that one group says it's from within. The other group leans toward the idea that it's from without. That's where you're talking about the supernatural, okay? That's where you're talking about literally some kind of, you know, intelligence that's part of consciousness. That's a supernatural idea. And that's where so much of this stigma comes from. And that's where the, the grave problems arose. And that's what happened at DOD. Because a number of the soldiers that were trained to be psychic, my read on it is that they entered into this world with such, you know, gusto, and it was so new and and imaginative and unbelievable. And here they are in a classified program being told, you can be trained to be psychic. And by the way, the CIA doctors that I interviewed were at the time saying, this is very dangerous to the Defense Department. You should not do this. This is going to lead to problems. And it did lead to problems because a couple of these 
soldiers in training went rogue, if you will. And they began to, you know, pursue ideas about alien technology. I mean, this is when you're kind of going off the reservation the way Puharek went off the reservation at CIA. Maybe fine, perfectly fine pursuits at home on your own time. But some of these soldiers began to use government time um, to try and you know, unsolve the mysteries of the aliens, let's say. And there's all these declassified documents that show this. And, you know, why the Pentagon did not step in, why the handlers there did not step in and and put an end to this, I have no idea. Graf's position is that he was too high up to know. The manager that I interviewed said, you know, it wasn't, it was brought to his attention too late in the game. But ultimately, Several of these soldiers retired, and then they started to go public with this uh, classified information. And when the public gets a hold of something like this, it's like dropping a match into a tinderbox. And ultimately, the story became very public. That ridicule enters into the scene, as always. And, you know, there was an expose on TV, and it led to the the downfall of the program. Well, it's too bad that people laugh about things when you're trying to figure it out, because even the alien topic, I I don't know what I believe, right? But there are a lot of people who seem very sane, who are level-headed, that have had experiences and are really looking into things and and have uncovered a lot of things. So it, it's too bad that we can't just pursue science and pursue and try to figure things out and instead of laughing at people because I, I want to know. <laughs> you know, it's like I want to know what that is. I haven't had an experience well, myself, but it sure seems interesting. I think that's why the Gallup poll is, is is accurate in in you know revealing that so many Americans are interested in this because people people do have an interest and they do want to know. I try to remind readers in the narrative of phenomena that, w- however, the Defense Department and the CIA have a responsibility to keep their programs you know in between two guardrails, and the guardrails yes. that they had set out for this program did not involve you know hunting for aliens and so or that organization. That organization that is defined, that's not their responsibility. Yes, yes. And so it created a firestorm. Well, okay. So what elements of the program exist today? They didn't just completely drop it. They're doing things today as well, right? And, I mean, it's not probably still classified, so you don't know. But what do do you know? Well, what's interesting is that if you look at the programs that I'm reporting on, I, I t- and I do this in all my books where I show the reader, okay, this, going back a decade, two decades, this is what was known publicly, here's what we know now. And so you can begin to see, aha, you know, there's a pattern going on here where the tip of the iceberg is revealed, but there's so much more. And so... In the last part of the book, I talk about the modern era, and I'm able to go on the record, I think for the first time, with some of these programs that have now been rebooted and rebranded under this banner of high technology. I mean, they call them anomalous mental cognition. One DOD program um, calls it perceptual training systems and tools. And then the slug line below that is sense-making. So that's just a different word for ESP. The the way they define, the Defense Department defines sense-making in 2017 is, this is, is interesting, it's such great nomenclature. They call it a motivated, continuous effort to understand connections among people, places, and events in order to anticipate trajectories and act effectively. I mean, when you by throwing the word events in there, you realize, my goodness, they are essentially looking at precognition again. Because events in the future, that is divinatory by its very nature. But because it's under the banner of high technology, um, it's got a little more cachet. And on some level, I, I don't mean to belittle this or, or snicker at it, because on some level, by keeping it under this header of technology, it's getting a little bit more cachet. It's not being ridiculed because the the government in earnest is looking at human physiology, um, the brain, and using advanced 
computer technology, using advanced brain scan technology to try and make sense of this extraordinary feature that some humans seem to have. Well, and they have the ability now to measure energy, right? The energy flow in our body. They know that we have energy. We, they know that we have an electric pulse, for example. So the yeah. advanced technology can start having some answers. But now with the way that we have technology that can actually interact with the brain, how is that evolving with this? I, I would assume so much of this is classified. Yes. Well, again, I, what, I, what I was able to report in the book is the tip of the iceberg. But the tip of the iceberg is super interesting. And you're talking about a program um, that the Defense Department calls Power Dreaming. And interestingly, there's a, there was a sister program or a, you know, an earlier program um, in the 70s at the Defense Department called um, bi- that involved biofeedback techniques, right? So now they, this is this idea that you, if you have, if you're if you're hooked up to a system where you can see how your own biology is functioning, you can somehow change that biology with your mind. Okay, so this is super at the edge of psychokinesis because it's affecting matter with the mind, physi- human physiology with the mind. Um, you know, on sim- simple terms, it's called the mind-body connection. But in DOD, they call it power dreaming, and they're using it specifically. The application is for soldiers who are plagued by these PTSD-related nightmares from experiences that they had in Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're working on this program up at the Naval Hospital in Washington, in Bremerton, Washington, where these soldiers who have, you know, horrific PTSD that nothing has been helping, they wake up in the middle of the night with one of these nightmares, and they hook themselves up to the power dreaming system. And what it is, they're essentially measuring their own brain waves, heart rate, mus- muscle tension, things like skin conductance, and they're putting this device on. It's like a 3D goggles and um, and this biofeedback device. And then they're going into a computer system, into a virtual world. And it's so strange and visual, but they they have pre-programmed a virtual world that at the front end involves the specifics. So they've worked with the, with Defense Department scientists in advance for this. They, the specifics involve their actual event that happened. So one of the examples that I was shown as a journalist was a soldier who had um, a horrific PTSD situation from an, a, a Humvee in front of him being blown up in Afghanistan. So his power dreaming virtual virtual reality situation goes like this. At first, he's right there in that world, but then instead of and and they, and you see the you know the cartoon version of the of the Humvee in front of him blow up and horrific carnage, soldiers die, and then it's like backed up, okay, like in 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 you know reverse. And then instead of the event actually happening this time, there's a good outcome. And then that soldier in this virtual world can, like, go off to the beach in Hawaii. Um, He can even have a dog as a companion or a dragon. I mean, it's very surreal and high-tech and out-of-body, except for it's electronic, all kinds of sort of 1970s concepts that were part of these ESP pursuits are now in this virtual reality world. And it's like the, the holodeck part, except that you're just it, or the what the avatar movie except you're Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And one has to think it was somewhat modeled after that. And you know, there the really interesting part is that soldiers are saying that this is helping with their PTSD. Oh, so that this makes touches sense. upon the idea of is it psychokinesis or is it the placebo effect? Or is it the self-fulfilling prophecy? Again, you know, all kinds of people on different sides of the aisle will tell you different things. Well, when you were diving into your research, did you run across any other interesting things? Like, did anybody talk to you about MK Ultra or other psychological psychological experience experiments? I would, just, you know, it might be in different departments because I know that they do that departmentalization. 
But did you run into anything that where they talk about MK Ultra? Because there's a lot of people coming forward talking about MK Ultra experiments that are kind of nefarious. And I was wondering if you run into any of that. In my research, um, I reported on Puharik's role in the MK Ultra program. And then I moved, because the MK Ultra program is 1950 CIA. And then I moved through the 60s and 70s and all the way up to what we've been talking about in the present tense. And, you know, if there are any nefarious programs going on um, in the government today, I certainly didn't um, interview individuals who were part of them. And they wouldn't be because those programs, if they exist, and I'm not saying they do or don't, would certainly be cra- classified. And that is why the sort of other mystery of all of this kind of reporting is that more gets revealed decades later yes. through things like the Freedom of Information Act. So what else did you uncover that gave you a spark for your next book? Because <laughs> that's what you said at the beginning. So I'm yes. circling back. Well, that's a great note to end on. And um, what I will say is that the spark was there and that it it specifically uh, – I'm I'm working with some programs that were run by the CIA, but I always keep my cards close to the to the vest. Um, a because I enjoy working in this arena so much, and B because I really like it to be a surprise, so that when my new book comes out, um, you know, people get that get their aha moments, and I think phenomena is filled with them where, you know, you realize, my goodness, I had no idea the government was pursuing this kind of research to this degree for this long. Or that Edgar Mitchell had a secret involvement with the CIA. I mean, this is the first time it's come out. These are these marvelous moments as a reporter that you kind of happen upon where you're able to report things um, you know, long form for the first time. And that's, again, one of the great luxuries of being able to write a 440-page book on this. I mean, little articles have come out in bits and pieces, but when you're able to write such a big history of something, I think it's tantalizing for the reader to also be able to look at Again, how this has all changed from the world that we live that existed after World War II, where you know advanced technology was home radio, and now, as you said, we have you know spacecraft searching um, you know uh, Earth-sized planets in other universes. Oh yeah, there's there's a it's a tsunami that's going to hit us with this new technology coming and how it's going to affect society, but. Now, you can you give us a brief overview of some of the other books you have and how they can get hold of this book? Because you have won major awards. You won a Pulitzer Prize, right, on your last book? I was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for the Pentagon's Brain. That's a book about DARPA and about very hard military science from 1958 when the organization was created all the way through today, which deals with artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons and even the Defense Department pursuits of merging man and machine to create cyborgs. I know that sounds like science fiction, but that is uh, in the end of the Pentagon's brain. And then before that, I wrote Operation Paperclip, which was about the program to bring Nazi scientists to America after the end of World War II. And my first book in this series, if you will, was Area 51, the story of that top secret military base in Nevada. So all of the books read, um, they, they intersect in many ways, and they all deal with war weapons, U.S. national security, and secrets. I got to tell you, this was a very fascinating book. I learned there's a lot of juicy information in here. It's pretty interesting. So now where can they buy this book? Uh, bookstores everywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, and if anyone wants to get in contact with me, AnnieJacobson.com. And are you going to be at any book signings or any tours where they can see you personally? I'm in the middle of a book tour and tonight I'm going to be speaking at the Harvard bookstore in Cambridge. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me and when your next book comes out i am definitely going to have you on and if you once you're done with this book tour and you're kind of beyond that 
I would like to talk to you about the whole cyborg thing and what you've learned since and how that is all coming together because with AI and some of the things that are going on with high technology, I, it's just such a fascinating field right now. I'd be delighted to come back. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much, and you have an amazing day. Thanks for having me. And that's all we have today. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Annie Jacobson. If you missed the first part of this interview, be sure to go to my website, sarahwestall.com, and you can hear the first part. You can also get the second part again. It will be posted up there. You can get it on podcasts, and you can get it on my YouTube channel if you prefer to watch it on YouTube. But it's all over the place. It's on 90-plus different streaming and podcast digital channels. But, of course, you can also subscribe on my website to whatever channel you want, whether it's iTunes or YouTube. And please be sure to subscribe to my newsletter. It goes out about once a week, once a week and a half, and it gives you all the updates on the shows that I have been doing. So if there's a specific show you really want to watch or listen to or what are your favorite people that you've been following and I happen to interview them, you'll be able to see it in my newsletter. So I want to tell everybody for now, have an amazing day.